I am tired of watching this world burn. Everywhere I see violence, bloody conquests, raging revolutions. Someone must remind this crazy world that all men are brothers. And that someone might as well be me. In the early 1900s, colonial wars were spilling blood all over the globe. And Anayat Khan, a very famous Indian musician, decided to do something about it. He wasn't just a brilliant musician, he was a Sufi master. Sufism is rooted in Islam, but it's not a religion. There is no sacred book to follow, no instruction. Sufism is an inner journey towards love and compassion, and meditation is the vessel. The wailing dervishes in Turkey, for example, have long been using dance as a form of active meditation. Sufis don't care about flags, skin colors, or religions. Anyone can be a Sufi as long as he genuinely seeks the intelligence of the heart. Rumi, a famous Sufi poet, once said, Yesterday, I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today, I am wise, so I am changing myself. Anayat Khan was convinced that the tolerance and universality of Sufism were the answer to all these wars and violence. If you want something done right, you must do it yourself. And that's exactly what Khan did. He founded his own Sufi order, and in 1910, he left India to spread the Sufi wisdom to the Western world. For 10 years, Khan traveled the world. In 1920, he settled in Paris with his wife and four children. They moved to a beautiful house that was renamed Fazal Manzil, which means House of Blessing. It was an open house, always full of music and meditation, with Sufi guests visiting around the year. Khan was fulfilling his promise of bringing the Sufi message to the Western world. And for a brief moment, the Sufi values of love and harmony blossomed in the heavenly garden of Fazal Manzil. This bubble of happiness, art and spirituality burst abruptly when Anayat Khan died in 1927. But even though the man was dead, his legacy lived on through his children. Vilayat, the older brother, went on to study Sufism in Paris, while Noor, the elder sister, devoted herself to writing children's books. And every story she wrote was infused with Sufi wisdom, like this tale where the monkey king explains how to be a good ruler. It's not your sword that makes you king, it is love alone. If you wish to be a righteous ruler, the happiness of your people must be dearer to you than life itself. It seems as if Anayat Khan himself were speaking through the monkey's mouth, telling us how to bring some harmony into the craziness of the world. We should love our fellow man and be ready to sacrifice for him. And we should always reject violence. Violence, however, was raging all over Europe. And even the garden of Fazal Manzil was no longer a safe heaven. On the 22nd of June 1940, France surrendered to Germany. Sorry, Mr. Khan, the world was not becoming a better place. As the panzers entered Paris and the sound of the German boots echoed in the streets, compassion was being squashed on the ground. On this very day, Noor and Vilayat spent the night in the oriental room of Fazal Manzil contemplating the dark future while silently gazing at the distant lights of Paris. Velayat spoke first. Right at our door, he said. People are calling for mercy, they're being tortured, treated like dogs. If we stand by and let the Nazis exterminate millions of people, what does it make of us? Like our father, we pledged ourselves to live by the Sufi principles and to respect people of all religions and cultures. Today the time has come not only to live by these principles, Maybe to die for them too. Noor kept silent for several long minutes. You're right, she said. We have to do something. But fighting, killing people, is it right? What would father do? Spirituality in action, said Vilayat, was the real teaching of our father. Shooting guns is only one way of fighting. As dawn broke over Paris, Noor and Vilayat welcomed the first day of their new life. The die was cast, they would stand against the Nazis and even expose themselves to the greatest dangers, but they would not carry weapons, because it is not the sword that makes you king, it is love alone. They immediately left for London. 
there, Vilayat volunteered for the Royal Navy, and without firing a single shot, he served as a mine-sweeping officer, risking his life under heavy fire along the coast of Europe. For Noor, however, a five-foot-tall woman with an Indian name, the path to heroism was slightly less obvious. She joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, but most jobs offered to women in the military were merely administrative ones, and she wanted to do more. Her younger brother was out there risking his life. She didn't want to be just a stenographer. Noor was smart and hardworking, so she was finally offered a training as a radio operator. She took it immediately, hoping that she would soon honor her promise to stand against the Nazis. And Lord knows she would, far beyond what she would have ever imagined. Because precisely at the same time, a very special organization was desperately looking for radio operators. In July 1940, Churchill had created the Special Operation Executive, SOE, to conduct secret sabotage missions behind the enemy lines. The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, as Churchill called it, had given the Nazis a few headaches in the early days. But the missions were so dangerous that many agents never returned home and the SOE always lacked men. So much in fact, that in 1942, they started recruiting women. On the 10th of October 1942, when she pushed the door of the 64 Baker Street for an interview, Noor had no idea what the SOE was. Selwyn Jepson, her recruiter, had read her file with attention. Her efficiency as a radio operator was not in question, but she was also described as dreamy, humble and shy, afraid of weapons. Jepson kept silent for a few seconds, lost in her deep black eyes, where he saw nothing but kindness. Could she possibly have what it took to do the job? Anyway, he needed to send a radio operator to Paris now, and Noor spoke French like a native, a luxury that was too rare to pass up. Jepson finally spoke. Should you accept the mission, you'll be sent to France as an undercover agent. You will wear no uniform, which means no protection. If you get caught, you will be tortured and executed. 17th of June, 1943. On a full moon night, three furtive shadows disembarked from a Lysander aircraft in the middle of the French countryside. One of them was Noor Anayat Khan. She had taken the mission without a second's hesitation, and there she was, ready to offer her life. Her courage was all she had, and all she needed. She didn't even carry the small Webley pistol that the SOE had given her, because it is not the sword that makes you king. Unfortunately for Noor, her mission was over before it could even start. The spy network she was about to join had long been infiltrated by the Gestapo, and a wave of arrest definitely took it down within a week of her arrival. She miraculously escaped and the SOE asked her to return home because it was far too dangerous to stay. But the shy and dreamy Noor had a job to do. She was the last radio operator in Paris and she wanted to help build another network to continue the fight. She ignored the warning and decided to stay. Her superior agreed, although he had no illusions about her fate. As a radio operator, Noor's job was to maintain a link between London and Paris, exchanging messages about sabotage operations or weapon supplies. And boy was that a tough job. Operators had to carry around their 20-pound radio transmitter without being stopped by the Germans or the French police. To make matters worse, the Germans constantly patrolled Paris with detection vans pick up the radio signals used by the resistance. In this context, the average life expectancy of a SEO radio operator in France was six weeks. Noor, however, managed to play cat and mouse with the Gestapo for more than three months. During this time, she was the only link between the SOE and Paris, and she helped London supply money and arms to the French resistance and organize the escapes of injured Allied pilots. But miracles only last for so long. Noor was finally captured in October and detained in Paris Gestapo's headquarters. There, she made a couple of naive escape attempts, but she was caught immediately both times. Hans Kiefer, the head of Paris Gestapo, called her up to his office. He must have felt this mixture of tenderness and admiration that Noor had the power to inspire in people, because he was surprisingly nice to her. Look, he said. I don't want to torture or execute you. Please, just give me your word you won't try to escape again. And this is when Noor made the last key decision of her life. 
with the brutal honesty that characterized her. She answered, Sorry, but I'm afraid I cannot give you my word, Herr Offizier. A few weeks later, she was deported to a prison in Germany, where she stayed for a year in solitary confinement, chained like a dog. During all this time, the amount of information she gave the Nazis was nothing. On the 11th of September 1944, she was sent to the infamous Dachau concentration camp, where she was executed soon upon arrival. The fear, the pain, the despair, what was it all for? None of that changed the course of the war, but that's not the point. Almost a century has gone by and Noor's life is still a powerful inspiration. Because she did the right thing. She stood by her values, she chose a path, and she stuck to it, no matter what. Her story is a modern-day Sufi tale about sacrifice. And Ayat Khan's effort has not been in vain. He did make the world a slightly better place.